All right, so we're sitting at 1104, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'll just say welcome to everyone who's joining us. Before we get started with today's presentation, we'd of course like to respectfully acknowledge that the Beringia Center is located within the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation, the Ta'an Kwachan Council. We respectfully acknowledge the history, customs, and culture of all Yukon First Nations for whom these lands are an ancestral home, as well as Indigenous peoples throughout the Americas with roots in Beringia. Uh, as you folks can see, my name is Claire, and I'm the Communications and Engagement Specialist here at the Beringia Centre. If you've tuned into a BCST before, you might have seen my face or you might have heard Christy, our manager, mention my name. I tend to work behind the scenes, but today I am co-hosting the talk with none other than Yukon paleontologist Grant Sazula. We always love getting people's questions, but uh, we try to keep them to the end of the discussion. So um, if you folks have any questions throughout the presentation, um, we will answer them at the end, but you can feel free to put them in either the chat or the Q&A section on Zoom or the chat on Facebook, and um, we will be asking Todd the questions at the end. And that leads me into the next thing, which is the introduction for our illustrious speaker, Todd Christensen. Todd is an archaeologist with the Archaeological Survey of Alberta, and he completed his MA in Newfoundland and his PhD in Alberta. He is married and is the happy father of a 10-year-old child whose forced knowledge of obsidian may come up later in therapy. So with that, I want to warmly welcome you, Todd, and I'll turn things over to Grant so he can say a few words before Todd get started. Great stuff. Well, it's really cool to have Todd here. Uh, Todd, I've known I've known you for a long time now. It's probably been twenty years. You know, we're starting yeah. to get long in the tooth and and all that as uh, as we get older and involved in these topics. And um, you know, the the ice free corridor to me is a topic that's something that I've always been very interested in and. Uh, it makes me think about um, people who've, uh, you know, done this kind of work in the past. You know, the Ice Three Corridor has been a topic that archaeologists and geologists and paleoecologists have had their hands in. Um, of course, it's been controversial in the past, too. But, um, you know, before I think we get started, I just wanted to say um, a bit of a tribute to Dr. Nat Rudder, who we just learned yesterday passed away. Uh, Nat Rudder was a uh, geologist at the University of Alberta, a quaternary geologist who was, uh, you know, it's it's impossible to overestimate how much impact he had on the field of quaternary geology and quaternary sciences, uh, particularly particularly in Western North America. And and the Ice Free Corridor was a topic that was very dear to Nat's heart as well. Um, I think back uh, uh, being an undergraduate student at the University of Alberta, taking classes with Nat. And uh, the topic of uh, the Ice Free Corridor was very central because it really brings together, like I said, uh, very various disciplines, uh, geologists and archaeologists and paleoecologists. And uh, yeah, so, um, you know, Nat's going to be dearly missed. He was a great, uh, great person. He was uh, a mentor to me. And uh, yeah, a lot of us are going to miss Nat. So uh, yeah, thank you, Nat Rudder. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Todd. Sounds good. Um, well, thanks for the introduction, and I do feel like I'm following in the footsteps of some great researchers from Alberta and abroad, including Nat Rudder, and contributing a small component with some of this obsidian work. Um, like Grant said earlier, um, the Ice Free Corridor has involved lots of different fields of studies, uh, which makes it interesting. Um, obsidian, the, what I'll be talking about today is one small component, but it's a chance to feed into other work and um, help confirm some ideas or refute other ideas, and that keeps it all interesting. So I'll just share my screen now and let me know if you guys can see that. Um, yeah, there, oh, not quite. We're looking at one of your publications there, Todd. There we go. There's your opening slide. Okay. Right on. That's great. Okay, so let me just see if I can retrieve my notes here. Maybe I can't. That's okay. 
Okay, so that looks good to everybody. Looks good. Yeah, it looks good there, Todd. You're, let's let's kick it off, man. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I had given a talk to the Yukon um, Long Ago group a couple of years ago, and this is a, a different topic. Um, I had talked earlier about a volcanic eruption near the Yukon Alaska border and its potential impact on people. This is something uh, totally different, but there is a slight overlap because both of those different projects involved obsidian work. Um, but um, when I was doing that project, I gained access to an Alaskan obsidian database put together by a guy named Jeff, Jeff Rasick. Uh, and it just blew my mind how powerful that database was. So I used that for my dissertation. When I got the position at the Archaeological Survey of Alberta, which is more of a regulatory body. It's not like a research-oriented university. Um, we more look after cultural resource management and things like that. Um, but when I got the job at the survey, uh, we had a little space at the side of our desk for some research mandates. And I tried to replicate the, the power of that Alaskan program by looking at obsidian work in Alberta and trying to source obsidian artifacts to understand where they came from. So shout out to Jeff for inspiring all, all that work. Uh, and also hello to a lot of other Yukon colleagues that I've uh, worked with over the years, uh, Ty Hefner and Susan McNinney and uh, Jody and Christy and um, people who have inspired me through their work like Ruth Goddard and Greg Hare uh, and other researchers who uh, will kind of um, be featured throughout this work. So it's a treat to come back to the Yukon and give this uh, talk uh, for the group. Thanks for having me. Okay, here's a little roadmap of what you guys can expect for the next um, 45 minutes to 50 minutes here. Um, I know people are coming from all over the world with different backgrounds. So I'm going to assume that everyone might appreciate a little bit of a foundation or a primer in some of these different fields that I'll talk about today. That includes obsidian. So I'll explain what obsidian is, um, why it was important for pre-contact people for thousands of years, and why it's important to archaeologists now. And then I'll talk about the role that Alberta plays in studies about the peopling of the new world, including its geographic position and its relationship to this ice-free corridor that opens up and connects land masses uh, in North America. Then we'll come back and talk about how obsidian can inform the settlement of the ice-free corridor. And that, that involves some hypotheses. Uh, and then I'll talk about what our work did reveal. So we recently published an article in August um, that this presentation is based on. Uh, so I'll share our results, including the significance, what it all means for um, archaeology in Alberta uh, and archaeology in the rest of North America. And there's just a figure illustrating this ice free corridor um, that ends up connecting Beringia to the rest of the United States, and it puts Alberta in an important position to help answer some of these big questions. Um, what should you do as audience members? Uh, I do have expectations of you. Uh, students in my class often ask if you can go to the bathroom during the talk. My answer to them is the same as it is to you. Uh, absolutely not, you cannot. I'm like a, a cat after you come back from a holiday. I'm neglected and I need complete attention from you for a very short period of time until I go about uh, and do my business for that day. Uh, no, you can go to the bathroom, but um, there is a section where I'll ask for a little bit of input in the chat. So I encourage you to participate in that. Like Claire said, you can ask questions in the chat. Um, and if I have time, I'll answer them during, but probably I'll save them for the very end. I don't have a timeline at the end of the lecture, so I'll stick around until the questions run out. All right. <clears throat> so obsidian is an extrusive volcanic rock, an igneous rock. Um, and it gets produced from magma that's extruded and it cools so quickly it lacks crystal structure. Uh, and that 
uniformity and that lack of internal crystal structure gives it pre-contact appeal. So for thousands of years, hunter-gatherers were attracted to obsidian for a number of reasons that relate to that structure and the appearance of it all. Um, I've included those images of broken glass. If anyone has, a young, has raised a young boy, you're familiar with how easily glass breaks. Um, obsidian is quite similar. Essentially, it's the same structure. Uh, it cools so quickly, uh, it resembles window, window glass. Um, and that imparts a sharpness to it. Obsidian is the sharpest naturally occurring material on Earth. Um, and it also breaks predictably. So that figure shows you something called a Hertzian cone of percussion. Basically, when a shock hits glass, it, it radiates outwards in a cone. Um, and to pre-contact people, that makes the reduction of obsidian very predictable. You can't just pick up any rock and crack it to produce your um, tools. A lot of it, it has internal inconsistencies. And even if it performed the function, it's so hard to break in a predictable way that you're wasting raw material and you're wasting time. So obsidian is different in that it's so uniform, it transmits those impact waves, those shock waves in a very predictable way so people could produce the exact kinds of tools and flakes that they wanted. Um, and lastly, uh, it's quite an attractive material. So you can see from some of those images, uh, those are all Alberta artifacts. And that hand is Ryan Reynolds, thanks to him for holding it. Um, in hindsight, I should have got a photo of his face. I don't know, I just got his hands. Um, but it's a very attractive material. It's lustrous. And some of it's opaque, some of it's translucent. And it, it's a material that you can't really replace with something else. A lot of other materials in Alberta and elsewhere in North America, whether it's shirts or quartzites or um, siltstones or mudstones, you can use a different type of rock that resembles it. It's got a similar appearance. Um, obsidian is not like that. There's really no other material that can replace the, the aesthetics of obsidian. And I think that factors into its appeal. So that plate represents a bunch of obsidian artifacts from Alberta, uh, and it represents almost the full um, gamut of uh, the time range of human occupation in the province. So we've got some of the oldest points there that are probably over 10,000 years old, uh, and some of the young tiny ones there are probably uh, less than 500 years old. So for that entire time span in Alberta, people have been attracted to obsidian. So um, I should also mention, because of that sharpness um, and that ease of fracture, obsidian is an ideal tool for specific tasks. You can use it for slicing and cutting uh, and piercing. And that made it valuable for spears and darts and arrowheads, as well as knives and some other tools. It's fairly brittle. So you generally wouldn't use obsidian for a coarse task like chopping wood or uh, breaking up bone because it will just fracture, just like a window glass would. Um, but if you're using a spear and your goal is to stab an animal and incur blood loss so that you can track that animal until it dies, obsidian is great. Um, and then if you're using a dart or an arrowhead or later technologies um, in Alberta's archeological record, those weapon systems are designed to penetrate through the hide of an animal and um, hit a vital organ, causing death uh, quicker than just incurring blood loss and opening up. An animal. And, and again, obsidian is ideal for that too, because it's nice, nice and sharp. And some of those things, they don't have an intended use beyond a couple events. So if you use a, an arrowhead once and it happens to break, um, that's not a big deal. You can replace it with something else. So obsidian is good for those types of tasks. The reason obsidian is also of interest to archeologists is because of its geochemical signature. So that diagram um, on the right just shows you obsidian forming, it begins as a magma and it absorbs trace elements from the surrounding magma chamber. And that imparts a geochemical uniqueness to it. 
So by the time that magma is pushed out of the volcano, um, the obsidian cools uh, really quickly. Lots of rocks um, in Alberta and North America take millions of years to form. Uh, obsidian takes hours, <laughs> days uh, to form. Uh, it cools so quickly um, uh, and it retains that chemical fingerprint. So in theory, every volcano that produces obsidian uh, has given that obsidian a unique geochemical, um, we call it a fingerprint. Sometimes um, people prefer just a, a unique chemical signature. So anytime we find obsidian artifacts, we can now analyze it in the lab, get the geochemical signature and connect it or match it to the volcano that produced that uh, obsidian. So on the left there, there's a map of Alberta. Uh, we have about 45,000 archeological sites in the province uh, as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, and about 40,000 of those are pre-contact. Uh, just to provide a little context for archeology span in Alberta and Obsidian. Um, about 40,000 of those sites are pre-contact. Around 37,000 of those archeological sites are just lithic tools and lithic debitage. So when you make a stone tool um, and crack off the flakes, uh, those things are called stone tools and debitage. So about 37,000 of those sites are just that. And we have about 32,000 sites in the province that are only debitage. There aren't even any lithic tools there. The point of all this is to illustrate that around 95% or more of our archeological record in Alberta is stone um, and flakes. We want to maximize the type of information we can get out of those flakes. And that has drawn our attention to raw materials or tool stones like obsidian. Unlike other raw materials in Alberta, obsidian has an embedded spatial information. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about that here. So um, a lot of the sedimentary rocks that are used to make stone tools in Alberta, like cherts and mudstones, you can pick it up and you really have no idea where the rock originally came from. But obsidian is different because of that geochemical signature. So by using lithic provenance or sourcing studies, we can link that artifact, the circle, um, to the volcanic origin, the natural outcrop of obsidian. I'll give you a bit more context here. Um, we looked at around a little over 300 archaeological, 300 of the biggest archaeological sites in Alberta um, and totaled up the artifacts to see what were the most common raw materials used in the province <clears throat> to help situate how rare obsidian is. Um, and this figure just depicts the top 10 materials used in Alberta. So it, it includes over 700,000 artifacts uh, that are broken down in that figure. In Alberta, most common raw material used to make stone tools was quartzite. So uh, brown represents um, an average of that raw material at each archeological site. Orange is a percentage of the total. It's a bit misleading because we have some regions in Alberta where there are pre-contact quarries, um, like Northeastern Alberta, where we've got a material called Beaver River Sandstone. And we have over 6 million Beaver River Sandstone artifacts that have been recovered. Um, it dominates the archaeological assemblage, but once you get beyond about 50 kilometers from the quarry, um, Beaver River sandstone kind of significantly drops off. So brown, the brown in the figure is the important one. If you're at an archaeological site, just about anywhere in the province, chances are about 50% of the lithics you find are going to be quartzite. And then we've got chert, uh, siltstone, and then quartz and another material called Swan River chert. Uh, chalcedony, um, petrified wood was fairly commonly used for stone tools. We've also got a material called Grizzly Ridge Chert, or Grizzly Ridge Opal, and Mudstone. Uh, obsidian isn't even on the list. So uh, do these sedimentary rocks have spatial information? Um, they do not. And this is a picture of the average Alberta archaeologist trying to cope with the lack of sedimentary, uh, lack of spatial information associated with all these sedimentary tool stones. Like I said, you can't figure out where they come from, so we don't have much information about spatial relationships. 
There are a few different rock types in Alberta um, that do impart spatial relationships and they're depicted on this map here, uh, as well as the surrounding region. So every triangle represents an outcrop of a material that we see in Alberta's archeological record. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about Tertiary Hills Clinker in the Northwest Territories. Um, um, some of those Montana materials are cherts, which we have identified in Alberta based on appearance. It's very hard to look at the geochemistry of some of these sedimentary rocks and tie it down to a specific spot. So we can't confirm that the artifact we find is coming from that spot other than looking at the appearance. Um, I want you to focus on the yellow triangles. Those are all obsidian sources. All of those obsidian sources uh, have been identified through geochemistry in Alberta's archeological record. Igneous rocks in general tend to be produced on a small spatial scale. A sedimentary bed can extend all the way up the Rockies. It can extend for thousands of kilometers. Each time it outcrops, it's essentially the same material in terms of geochemistry. Igneous rocks are not like that. They're formed in a smaller place and that tends to impart a more specific geochemistry, which is valuable for archeologists. All right. So uh, most of our tool stones are sedimentary in the province. Um, the reason that obsidian is so powerful is we don't have any natural obsidian outcrops uh, in the province. That um, map on the right shows you where Alberta is in yellow in relation to the rest of the states and provinces. And then all those orange triangles are natural obsidian outcrops that, that have come from volcanoes. Keep in mind that not all of those obsidians were usable to make pre-contact tools. Uh, sometimes the material is too friable or um, they only come out in small little examples, little modules that you couldn't actually crack into a stone tool. But I like that map because it shows you how isolated Alberta is. Anytime you find an obsidian artifact in our province, you know that it's been transported from far away. So it's a powerful thing. That map on the left shows you all of the archeological sites that have yielded uh, an obsidian artifact in the province. We have a little over 450. And this is based on site forms. So if an archeologist finds uh, an archeological site, they write up a site form, they include all this information, and then we can retrieve it um, when we're doing research. So we have about 450 archeological sites with obsidian. Some of this reflects where people were in the past, pre-contact activities, but a lot of the, the patterning behind those dots on the map relates to where industry activity has happened in the province that has driven cultural resource management, and that has driven the discovery of archeological sites. So keep in mind that we tend to have clusters of dots where we have clusters of oil and gas activity or other mining or forestry or logging or um, highway construction, things like that. So of those close to 700,000 artifacts um, that we looked at, obsidian is around 0.2% of that total. In other words, it's very rare. Um, um, it's not that common when we do find obsidian, but when we do, uh, it's quite exciting. So this is important context because you may ask a little later on why our sample size is relatively small. <laughs> we looked at 15 of the oldest obsidian artifacts to try to reconstruct this idea of how um, the ice-free corridor was settled. Um, the reason we did that is because obsidian is so rare. And when it does appear, it's most commonly small flakes. Um, we don't have a ton of finished tools or curated uh, artifacts that are made of obsidian. So our sample size is small by necessity. <clears throat> um, so, like I said before, um, Jeff Rasick had created this amazing database in Alaska and we kind of wanted to recreate something like that in Alberta. So over the past uh, 10 years or so, we have run um, sourcing studies on obsidian artifacts. And then we've compiled information about other sourcing studies that archeologists have done. So now we have a database of around a thousand obsidian artifacts that have been sourced 
their geochemical signature has been matched to a specific ball cam cut crop. Uh, and the, these are some of the results um, on these figures here. We have uh, the big four in Alberta. <clears throat> so those are Ziza obsidian, Anaheim Peak obsidian, Bear Gulch obsidian, and Obsidian Cliff obsidian. And then those figures on the left just show you where those volcanic outcrops are. Most of the obsidian in Alberta comes from Bear Gulch. That's in um, eastern Idaho. Uh, second most common is Obsidian Cliff from Wyoming, just across the border. And then there's kind of a line in Alberta you can draw. It's around the Athabasca River. It's Athabasca River and north. Most of the obsidian tends to come from British Columbia. That's either Itziza in northwestern British Columbia or Anaheim Peak, kind of west central British Columbia. And then we've got a few scattered pieces. Um, once you get to the North Saskatchewan River system that kind of bisects the middle of the province, on the North Saskatchewan River south, almost all the obsidian comes from Idaho and Wyoming. So um, I've included those maps on the left too to show you the situation that unfolds, kind of the opportunity that we have um, to use obsidian to look at the ice free corridor. And just for context, to help explain some of these patterns in a very general sense and to help you understand archaeology in Alberta, the reason that we have a lot of obsidians coming from Idaho and the Wyoming uh, area is because southern Alberta is an extension of a grassland ecosystem that creeps up into the southern part of the province. So that map on the left shows you the, the main ecosystems in the province. Much of northern Alberta is boreal forest, um, pretty similar to Northwest Territories and Southern Yukon. Um, and then we have a band of Aspen Parkland that separates the boreal forest from the prairies, um, the plains system. And that map on the lower left just shows you that those plains, those grasslands extend from Alberta all, all the way down to Texas. So it's fairly logical um, that people who are adapted to the northern plains are including some of these volcanic outcrops in their seasonal rounds, or they're exchanging it with their kin groups or other um, trade uh, networks on the northern plains. Um, once you're in a forest system, people tend to move their obsidian across the Rockies from British Columbia into northern Alberta's forests. So that, that's kind of neat in and of itself. We've got this band here where um, in kind of north central Alberta, you're more likely to get your obsidian from 800 kilometers away across the Rocky Mountains in Edziza or Anaheim Peak than you are to exchange it with people who live 80 or 100 kilometers to the south who get their obsidian from Idaho and Wyoming. So we've got a, a neat divide that likely persists for thousands of years. A forest adapted people that are fairly distinct from the plains adapted people. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, enter uh, the ice free corridor debate. These maps just show you um, during the last glacial maximum, this ice age when ice sheets covered uh, Alberta, there were times when Alberta was covered by ice over a kilometer thick, in some places uh, over a kilometer and a half thick. Imagine a kilometer of ice <laughs> in a vertical depth. It's amazing to think about. There was an ice sheet from the Northeast called the Laurentide that spread um, into Alberta and it met with a big ice mass from a collection of ice um, masses over the Cordilleran uh, and it kind of joined over top of Alberta. And then um, through the ice age, they started to melt and that unzipped and created this corridor that extends through Alberta. And eventually it connects southwestern Northwest Territories and Southern Yukon um, with the rest of the United States. Um, so these figures are just based on some reconstructions of ice sheet margins um, from a research team that published them in 2020. And keep in mind that it doesn't show you glacial lakes. So because of our mountain system in Alberta, we have high elevation in the west. Almost all our rivers flow off to the east. During that glacial era, 
those rivers pounded when they hit the ice and created these huge proglacial lakes. So these big water bodies covered much of the corridor as it was being exposed. I haven't depicted those on here, um, but just keep in mind, it looks like this open um, area that you could easily navigate through, but at one time it was populated with large bodies of water. So the reason that Alberta has kind of been um, the center of an uh, important debate is people are unsure of how the new world was first colonized or settled by people. There are a couple of models and one of them is gaining more popularity just in the past year because of these exciting new finds. <clears throat> but one model is that people came across Beringia, which connected um, Russia to Alaska, um, this big land mass. When all this water was tied up in ice, it created this land mass called Beringia. And people waited in Beringia. Um, they survived there. When the corridor opened, they moved through the corridor and then settled the rest of North America and South America. Another model is that um, when people first came into Beringia, they continued on south by the coast. So there were pockets of glacial um, ice-free areas along the coast. They migrated down on the coast of British Columbia and Oregon and Washington settled into the interior US and then pushed their way into the United States. And then when the corridor opens up, those people move north. So that's another model. And then something that's gaining popularity is that people didn't even really need to worry about the corridor, corridor because they had colonized North America much earlier, even back to 20,000 years ago. Um, and they existed in the United States um, at that time period. And then as the ice melted, uh, they returned up into the corridor area and potentially met with other northern people coming south. So there's some new sites in New Mexico and things, and, and in Idaho that are really pushing the date of New World colonization back deeper and deeper, from 16,000 years ago, um, in some cases to 20,000 years ago. So Alberta kind of figures in that debate. Um, archaeological work in the province can help answer some of these questions. In particular, hopefully you can see that near the northern and southern mouths of that ice-free corridor, there are obsidian outcrops. So um, near the northern mouth, we've got uh, Wiki Peak and Hoodoo Mountain obsidian. As well as well as Botsitana obsidian, a little further north, and then in the south um, we've got sources like Bear Gulch and Obsidian Cliffs um, that are close to the southern mouth. So if people came from the north to settle the rest of North America, we should see early obsidians in Alberta that come from Yukon and Alaska. That's hypothesis one. If they came from the south we should see early obsidian in Alberta from Wyoming and Idaho. So our task was to look at the oldest obsidian artifacts and see what the signature tells us. Uh, and this is the, the series of artifacts that we looked at. <clears throat> so they're depicted on the right there. Uh, we selected 15 artifacts that are old based on typology. Basically, they come from a specific time period based on their shape. And the association of these types of artifacts with radiocarbon dates elsewhere in North America. We don't have um, any radiocarbon dates associated with late Pleistocene or early Holocene obsidian in Alberta. So some people could say, oh, you should only look at dated sites with obsidian. We don't have dated sites that old. So, um, we're kind of limited in, in what we can look at. Um, but we went ahead and looked at these uh, old obsidian artifacts. Some of them are quite established and some of them are a little more contentious. So we do have a fluted point that's depicted there. It's the only fluted material made of obsidian in Alberta. So we just have one, one example of it in the entire province. Um, there was a purportedly another obsidian fluted point in the Red Deer Museum, but it was lost. Um, so if it's ever found again, we'd love to test that one. But we have a fluted point, and we've got this um, big, beautiful spear point that's depicted down there. It overlaps in morphology with some of these Clovis cache materials in Washington and Oregon. 
um, a really tight fit. So again, that looks like a, a safe bet for a Clovis Contemporary um, type of spear point. We've got some macro blades, and those are D, E, and F. Macro blades are generally associated with Clovis to Agate Basin assemblages in the rest of North America. We've got a, a big biface down there that in actuality, it could be from any era, from the late Pleistocene to the late Holocene, but it was found at an archeological site with that same fluted point. Uh, and it's also made of the exact same obsidian. So this is what led us to include that in the study. And then we've got some other Cody complex materials there. Um, we've got some um, Scotts Bluff, Alberta, looking points and bases. We've got two Eden points. Um, and then we've got this material that could be from the Mesa complex in Alaska or Agate Basin uh, in the plains. It kind of fits, could fit somewhere in there. So we've included that artifact as well. So this just shows you um, a table of those 15 artifacts. They span that time period, about 13,000 to 9,500 uh, calibrated uh, years ago. Okay. Uh, and then science happened. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, I'll, if you want a little more thorough, in-depth um, look at that, that science happened hard. You know, um, it involved portable X-ray fluorescence, which is a technique that irradiates the material and it produces um, an indication of what trace elements are in obsidians. So then the researchers that I worked with zapped all of those 15 artifacts and we plotted them on these element biplots. So the clusters that you can see are created by archeologists who have gone to that volcanic source. So they've created a library of the natural material to create a cluster of um, points. And then you just figure out where your artifact lies in relation to that cluster. Uh, in some cases, we wanted confirmation of our results. So we sent our artifacts to other researchers and other laboratories. And in the case of the Batsatena artifact, uh, we sent it to the expert on Alaska obsidians, up to uh, Jeffrey Rasick. And here are our results um, plotted there. <laughs> so uh, they're color coded. So the line matches the color of the volcanic outcrop that it comes from. Hopefully you can all see that. And then the table on the left just shows you the distances that would have been required to move that artifact to the archeological site um, that the artifact is found in. And they're quite extraordinary. You can see the earliest artifacts retain a Southern signal. So we've got that big spear point coming from Oregon, which was completely unexpected. And we've got some other points coming from Western Idaho, which was also unexpected. Um, and then we've got some other Cody complex materials coming from uh, Bear Gulch uh, and Obsidian Clear. That fluted point and the biface, which both come from the same archeological site, um, were sourced to Bear Gulch. Unlike the North, where we also uh, analyzed a bunch of Cody complex material, that Cody complex material comes from Edziza and Anaheim. So we're seeing an early divide, even by around 9,000 years ago, between those uh, forest adapted people in the north and plains adapted people in the south. And that one um, artifact, which totally blew our minds, um, was sourced to Batsatena, Alaska. So, so a couple of unexpected things. But for now, I'd, I'd like you to focus on those distances from artifact to volcanic outcrop because they're phenomenal. Um, in cases, people are moving raw materials over a thousand kilometers. In the case of Batsatena, over 2000 kilometers to move that raw material uh, in an artifact form into Alberta. So the early networks that these people carried were vast. We're not just interested in understanding who these people were, or where they came from, but what network of interaction did they retain when they settled in the corridor? Um, 
So the question that I wanted to ask you for, for participant observation before we go much further, um, I'll see if I can open up the chat here. I don't know if I can see it. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> um, if you do want to get involved, I want you to think about the most important thing in your life. If someone asked you, how would you define yourself? What are the, what's the most important thing in your life? If you could write an answer, it can be from one word uh, to maybe four or five words in the chat right now. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of time to populate it. What are the, what's the most important thing in your life? Okay, I'll give you a second. Okay, good. A couple of answers are pouring in. Please feel free to keep uh, doing that myself. All right, I'll give you another couple seconds. <clears throat> but for the most part, um, people said family, which I feel is the exact same way. Um, but it creates this tricky situation. When you ask people, what, what's the most important thing in your life? Very rarely do they say, well, it's the technology I have, except for Jode or whoever, or Margarita who said they're so funny. Very rarely do we say, oh, it's the technology I have. It's the way, I, the way that I kill an animal or the way that I secure my food. Most often we say it's family. It's the relationships in our life that define us. Those are the things that we value. And I'm sure that's the way it was, um, the way it's been for people for thousands of years. The trick is in archeology, span we tend to look at the opposite. We tend to focus on those physical things. What foods were people eating? What technologies were they using? Um, what kind of structures did they live in? Things that were definitely important to satisfying our primary needs, but they don't define us, we don't say, I am this type of person because of the gun that I use to kill an animal. So we say Cody complex because that refers to a particular point. The power of these lithic studies is that they get at that thing, the relationships, the things that define us. So when I say um, we're not just interested in understanding who these people were, where they came from, we're interested in the networks because those are the relationships um, that define these people. When they settle into that corridor area, they retain some type of kinship, some type of family connection, and that's what's being used to transmit these materials. And the fact that they're moving obsidian around may be relatively unimportant, but these lithics help pave the way to understand what their relationships were and what um, what channels they use to transmit other important things like language, uh, DNA, and ideas for adaptation, all, all sorts of important things. So even if you're not interested in lithics, lithic sourcing is a very powerful thing to help get at human relationships. Okay. So um, to get back to the talk, thanks for the audience participation. So are these obs obsidian distances extraordinary because that would be a cause for a concern if we say okay people are moving obsidian a uh, thousand five hundred kilometers to get into alberta that is um, totally beyond what we've ever seen that would be a, something we should um, be concerned about but if you look at the other raw materials that were used in alberta there is a precedent um, there are other materials that tell the same story so we have a material called Tertiary Hills Clinker from Northwest Territories that has been found in northern Alberta um, with a fluted point. And that material would have moved around 1,200 kilometers to get here. We do have a material called Knife River Flint that was used in Alberta. Knife River Flint outcrops in North Dakota. You can see it on the map on the top right there. Now, uh, and Knife River Flint was moving into Alberta during Clovis times. There's a couple examples of fluted points made out of Knife River Flint. 
Uh, and then just for comparison, we do have Jade, um, pre-contact Jade um, that was moved from South Central British Columbia across the Rocky Mountains into Alberta. That is more of a middle to late um, Holocene phenomenon, probably late Holocene. Um, but I included it to help illustrate that we tend to think of the Rocky Mountains as a barrier. So if you drew a line from Batsatena into Alberta, you have to cross a pretty significant mountain chain. Um, mountains weren't the same barriers that um, we tend to think of now. We saw the movement of materials. We've seen the movement of materials like jade across the Rocky Mountains, um, through Alberta, and even into Saskatchewan and, and southwestern Manitoba. And we've written up these little papers by doing the same thing that we're describing here, geochemical work to connect those artifacts to their outcrops. All of those papers are available for free online. If you search uh, Archaeological Survey of Alberta publications, um, we put out a little paper series and you can check out some of those papers. So the obsidian um, kind of fits within there to a degree, although Botsatana obsidian stands out on its own. Um, Imagine people moving something 2,000 kilometers uh, in that era from somewhere around 13,000 years ago to 9,000 years ago. There's the Batsatana point um, that's depicted there. Again, we want to look at other examples of Batsatana to see if the Alberta example stands on its own, which would be a cause for concern. Batsatana was moved into the Yukon as well as northeastern BC. There are some archaeological examples of Batsatana obsidian there, um, which is odd because Adzaza is so much closer. So it implies that there's a cultural significance behind the movement of these materials. Uh, and there's one other archeological site in Alberta, in Northeast Alberta, um, that has yielded obsidian um, from Batsatena as well as Wiki Peak. And that's dated to around 7,500 uh, to 4,000 years ago. Okay, so what does it all mean? <clears throat> Um, how does obsidian inform settlement of the Ice Free Corridor and potentially the New World? And then I'll, um, I'll conclude the talk with a quick discussion of why it's important in the big picture. So we generally see a strong signal from the south in the earliest, the bonafide early um, obsidian artifacts. And it doesn't just point to the south. It points to a connection to the Pacific Northwest and the Intermountain regions. So this would be the Intermountain regions would be what kind of borders the Northern Plains off to the west. And the reason I say Pacific Northwest is because Glass Butte Obsidian has also been found at a place called Paisley Caves in Oregon. So of all the obsidians that have been used in North America, uh, I think it has the oldest associated radiocarbon date that's pushing it to around 14,400 um, calibrated years ago. So the fact that people were using that obsidian that long ago, and we see an early expression of it in Northwestern Alberta, it kind of draws a, a path of footsteps connecting the province to the Pacific Northwest region. If the United States was settled much earlier <clears throat> and a resident population was living on the Northern Plains and then moved north into the corridor, we would expect to see obsidian that's pretty much exclusively from Bear Gulch, not from Idaho, Eastern Idaho, uh, or obsidian cliffs from Wyoming. Uh, but we don't, we see this signal coming from Oregon as well as uh, Western Idaho with that Timber Butte uh, example. Um, in the paper, we, we argue that this is because of a type of lithic founder effect. So if people did come down from the coast on route to settling the new world, they would have gained familiarity with those high quality tool stones and brought them with them to a greater degree than later times uh, as they're colonizing new landscapes uh, and essentially being pioneers in, in places that humans had not adapted to before. So when you've been living in a place for several thousand years, you're familiar with the local tool stones and where they are, you know how to adapt your season around to pick up raw materials um, and make into stone tools. When you're not as familiar with that landscape, you bring more of the high quality stuff with you. So again, that, that 
suggests that there's a, an earlier occupation of that Pacific Northwest region. As people are moving into the interior along something like the Snake River Plains that kind of cut the Rocky Mountains and expose this uh, area to come up into Alberta, um, they're bringing these raw materials with them. And then that pattern kind of gets truncated and cut off. Later in Cody complex times, we don't see Oregon obsidians showing up in Alberta anymore, uh, and even some of the Western obsidians. You see it just swamped by obsidian cliff from Wyoming and um, the Bear Gulch obsidian from Eastern Idaho. But we do see a little trace signal coming down from the north. And that's supported by uh, like bison ancient DNA work that suggests that as the corridor opened, uh, bison occupied that area and steadily moved north, but eventually met up with bison populations from the north, and they kind of um, met in the interior of the corridor. Even though there's a strong southern signal, um, they're meeting isolated um, groups or smaller groups from the north. Exact same signal in the obsidian. Uh, dominated by the south, but they were occasionally interacting with groups from Beringia who were working their way south. Regardless of the ultimate impact, um, these networks were incredibly huge. So when I say uh, 2,000 kilometers, that's, that's similar to the distance from Switzerland to Moscow. Um, it's similar to the distance from the southern tip of Spain to Northern Ireland. Um, they're incredibly vast networks. And I asked you about the important things in your life. I and mean, for most people, the answer was relationships. I think relationships were a key adaptive strategy as people pioneered and moved into these new landscapes. Sure, they had come up with clever ways to survive, but those kin networks were crucial to their survival. And that's why they were so huge during those early phases of human occupation in the ice free corridor. And then on a, a smaller level, Northwest Alberta and Northeastern British Columbia, which are sometimes called the peace region, it represents kind of a meeting ground of Southern people um, who are moving North and encountering um, these strangers from Beringia. Um, so why is that all important? Like I said, I think these relationships, human relationships are the means that people are using to adapt to places uh, and survive long-term. And then our lithic provenance work, including obsidian, is a means to reconstruct those channels of interaction and the networks of human relationships. When you start piecing all these things together, you can understand how things move, how fluting technology uh, moves through North America, how languages move, how DNA moves, uh, how other um, technological systems move. So this obsidian work that we're doing is just an initial step, kind of a launching pad for other archeological studies that involve um, human relationships. And this is just a quick map. So we've spent the past 10 years or so looking at different raw materials in Alberta as part of this Alberta Lithic Reference Project. And, and obsidian is one, one component of it. And we can start to create these interesting maps where you look at the spatial extent of tool stones um, over time. This is not specific to the late Pleistocene or early Holocene. Uh, it's just a general map, but you've got Knife River Flint in orange, got a material called porcelainite in purple there. You've got jade in green coming from BC over the Rockies. You've got Edziza obsidian in yellow that extends from Alaska. Its uh, extent goes from Alaska down into um, central Alberta. And then we've got tertiary hills clinker kind of in a maroon and some other local materials throughout there. It's just amazing to think of how connected people were. We tend to think of the past as uh, isolated hunter-gatherers uh, adapting um, to specific spots. Um, they had networks that extended um, thousands of kilometers. Okay, um, so I'll just quickly thank some of the co-authors of that paper that I worked with, Robin Wawitka, uh, Timothy Allen, Jack Ives, uh, Gabe Yunicki, and Jeffrey Rasick. And then there are some other people who have either helped with the study, helped loan artifacts or secure permission, or funded some of the research. And now hopefully we've got um, enough time um, that you can ask any questions you like. Great, well, thank you very much, Todd. That was fantastic. Uh, that was a, a really great presentation showing it's, it, 
it's it's interesting to me when you when you kind of sum it all up it seems like Alberta was this place where people or ideas or technologies came to uh, and sort of, you know, congregated. Uh, one thing that I kept on thinking if, you know, if people are trading high quality tool stone like Obsidian or bringing it into Alberta, I'm wondering what from Alberta is going outside in terms of like some sort of reciprocal type relationships. If, yeah, Alberta can't just be the sink for everything. There has to be things leaving as well if there's, you know, these relationships and these trade networks. And um, yeah, just wondering if you know of anything in the in the toolstone record or the artifact record that shows that things from Alberta are leaving and showing up in other places around the continent. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And one that has kind of occupied archaeological thought for quite a while here because <clears throat> there are other eras in Alberta's archaeological past when we see spikes in exotic raw material. So we see a big spike in Knife River Flint during the Cody complex and again during the later phase. And the question has always been, okay, if lots of these materials are coming in, what's going out? And I think one of the common thoughts is it's, it's not raw materials. I showed you that diagram of the common raw materials in Alberta, quartzites and petrified wood and quartz and calcedons. Those things tend not to be traded very far but it could be meat. Um, and unfortunately it's archeologically invisible for to a large extent because um, those types of things don't preserve very well unless you're looking at isotope studies and things like that. But because Alberta has that ecotone, kind of a, a meeting of the Northern Plains with the parkland and the boreal forest, it ends up bringing animals in, to that landscape to a greater degree than elsewhere. We could have masses of bison um, that are coming into Alberta. We have a lot of buffalo jumps in the province. So it could be that um, people are exchanging meat um, in the form of pemmican or other uh, preserved foods and hides, um, exchanging those outward. Um, and we see those raw materials like um, obsidian and interesting exotics coming into the province. So if you extend that to the late Pleistocene, I'm not sure if that applies as well because I don't know if the bison populations were as high back then as they were during periods of the Holocene. You might be more qualified to answer that question um, than I. Um, but that, that could be what's happening. People are coming into the province for, for meat and hides and other perishable things, um, and the raw materials are, are coming in with them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that that makes sense. That's uh, yeah. I've always uh, I've thought of that, and the, that's a really good explanation. You know, I think of the something like the the bison jumps and bison pounds, which were, you know, producing meat at an almost industrial scale. Um, you know, that would have been a very valuable resource that a lot of other groups, or you know, in in law uh, in distances away from Alberta, could uh, really uh, treasure and want to get a hold of. So that that makes a lot of sense. That's a great explanation, Todd. Um, we got a, a number of questions in the in the chat, in the Facebook, and whatnot. And um, one that 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 caught my eye right away is is from Rob Young, uh, someone who's worked a lot on the Ice Free Corridor, but he's asking, you know, what how do we define the ice free corridor in time and space and whether that term has changed meaning over time? Because, um, you know, the, the term, the ice free corridor has been used for decades and decades now. And it sort of implies, you know, I think a lot of people have this vision of, you know, two big glaciers in this corridor, you know, where there's, uh, kilometers of ice on either side and people are sort of running down or, uh, or, or, or like that, or animals moving up and down. Um, I, I think one thing that's important as, as part of that is that prior to that coalescence at the last glacial maximum that you showed, you know, it was ice free. There was no, there was a corridor. There was always a corridor. It was really only during the lake. We're only really talking about the late glacial here. So I don't, I'm wondering if you want to sort of expand on that a bit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm sure Rob is very familiar with the, the way it's changed over time, but for the sake of the audience, and um, I think that's right. We're interested in the ice-free corridor because, because of the human story. People had been in Beringia and likely in the United States during that era when the corridor exists, 
but for much of um, geological history, there was no corridor. It was an open space. And our idea of the corridor has changed so much over time as we get a better sense of where these proglacial lakes were. I mean, it wasn't this open navigable place that was free for um, woolly mammoths and other animals to go through and people would follow them through. It was a much more complicated and geologically active place where um, lots of things are happening. So that might be the story that emerges as we get older and older dates in the United States that the corridor question isn't really important for settling the new world. It's an important story for Alberta because people use the corridor uh, as an initial means to get into what we now call Alberta, um, but it, it may have been less relevant to new world colonization studies. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, I think uh, I see Kelly Montiglione uh, commenting that really what we're talking about is the the late glacial, we're talking about the deglacial corridor, and rather than, you know, this corridor that existed for all time, or it's really, a, we're really talking about a very narrow point in time and, and space, rather than something that's, uh, uh, you know, was, it, it's not like the Bering Land Bridge, which was formed and erased and formed and erased numerous times throughout the Pleistocene. There was only one you know, time when we had the coalescence, the ice sheets, and really only one opportunity for that deglaciation corridor to exist. So, yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's important to put those sort of spatial and temporal qualifiers when we do talk about this region, because it does get, uh, gets people, the hair on people, the back of their necks uh, stand up sometimes, and, as we know. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. That, um, the time when it was closed is a, is kind of a, a finger snap or a blink. So when we call it ice free, it implies that, oh, there was just a narrow time when it was ice free, but that's not the norm. It was ice free for huge amounts of time during the late Pleistocene. It's just when humans arrived, that blockade seemed to have been there. So we've retained that idea of the ice free corridor, but the glaciation corridor will probably make a little more sense in terms of the timing of it all. Definitely. Um... A little different, a uh, little different question here from Julie on Facebook. She's asking if um, obsidian has ever been made into like decorative type artifacts in the archaeo that you find in the archaeological record, or is it always turned into utilitarian kind of technology? Do we do we saw, see some of those like amazing obsidian type artifacts that you get maybe from Aztec cultures in Mexico or whatnot? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are certain cultures in North America and Central and South America that uh, took obsidian flint napping to a whole new level and did craft it into artistic things. Sometimes we call them eccentrics, um, things that kind of defy a functional explanation. There are some obsidian eccentrics in Alberta. I've seen a few of them in museum collections. I don't think I've ever seen any recovered from an archaeological project. So they would be things that were plowed up by farmers and um, discovered that kind of way. Um, but the eccentrics represent different animal forms. So it could be um, could be a bear or it could be some type of quadruped um, with little arms extending out. But that's very rare. So of those, I don't know how many artifacts we've looked at, a little over a thousand. Um, I, I can think of one eccentric that looks like an animal. Hey. Googled it quickly so I could see if I could drop a picture in the chat and actually something you had uploaded to ResearchGate came up, Todd, from looks like Wally's Beach, which leads into a question we received from uh, uh, John Easton. And he was asking about um, if there was any significance to Wally's Beach. I didn't catch what part he was referring to. I don't know if you did, Grant. Um, well, Wally's Beach is, uh, you know, a super important site in the middle of the corridor, or the southern part of the Ice Free Corridor, deglacial corridor, if we want to start using that term. Um, yeah, just uh, is is there any obsidian at Wally's Beach? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if the obsidian's ever been excavated from there. Yeah, there has been obsidian, but to my knowledge, um, it hasn't been associated with any radiocarbon dates. Like much of the material, it's been recovered from the surface. Um, there's some old mifer flint there too, so. It is a very important site for the rest of the audience. Uh, Wally's Beach is this place where there's a late Pleistocene trackway, where there are thousands of preserved tracks in the mud of woolly mammoth and muskox and caribou and bison. Camel. 
and camel, yeah, and horse. Um, and there's also some butchered camel and horse remains there, and um, potentially some blood residue that's been found connecting um, stone tools to camel butchering uh, and horse butchering. Um, so it's a really important site that demonstrates that around 13,500 years ago, people had moved into that southern opening of the corridor. Unfortunately, the obsidian that has been found at Wally's Beach can't be tied to that occupation as opposed to the ensuing thousands of years when um, those reservoir deposits were exposed and it's just been winnowed down. So you've got all these artifacts just kind of compress on top of each other. It's very hard to say. Is this from 13,000 years ago or is this from 7,000 years ago? Another, another site that has always factored into this whole conversation about uh, the deglacial corridor and human sort of dispersals is Charlie Lake Cave. And Harry Clark on Facebook is asking about thoughts on Charlie Lake Cave and how this relates to the... To the, the um, hypothesis the kind of the story you've put together with obsidian and the movement of people in this region yeah well charlie lake cave i think remains the only um fluted material in the corridor that has a secure um radiocarbon date with it um so charlie lake cave is in the peace region uh, and it's important for those preserved um, strata i don't think there's any to my knowledge, I don't think there's any obsidian that's been recovered from the oldest levels of Charlie Lake Cave. So it didn't factor into our study. Otherwise, we, we would have looked at it. We did look at some sources um, of obsidian artifacts in the BC side of the Peace region, but we couldn't conclusively say they were coming from a particular um, radiocarbon data deposit. So um, Charlie Lake Cave has been used to demonstrate that fluting technology originated in the south and then spread north up into Alaska, which our, our work is also suggesting that there's a strong southern signal of things um, as, as that corridor opens, that southern presence populates it, uh, and eventually you get the spread of technologies and other things um, that are moving north uh, through the Peace Region into Alaska and Yukon. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm gonna, off the top of my head here, I. I do you think that Charlie Lake Cave as well has both northern clade and southern clade bison found in the deposits? Um, so again, that whole notion of southern peoples and faunas mixing with those from Beringia uh, in that peace region of uh, northeast BC. There, I think there's also a fluted point from Pink Mountain as well, near there as well. Uh, I'm not sure if it's... yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, I see Mar Margarita is asking a, a question about uh, about the end point of artifacts life. So she's wondering about, um, you know, from from this work, do you feel the end point of the artifacts life is indicative of the tool traveling these extensive distances through traded relationships, or that the individuals or groups were traveling these long distances from point A to B, carrying those artifacts. So was it raw materials or was it finished tools or how do you, how do you feel some of that stuff is being transported by people? Yeah, that's uh, another good question. It is hard to say um, with those obsidian tools, if you're gonna travel those far distance, any distance, you don't wanna walk around with unnecessary weight. So you'd probably be reducing it to the, the smallest form possible, but Remember, we found that one site, or there is an archaeological site up near Grand Prairie in the Peace region that produced a big obsidian biface um, at the same site as that fluted point. So that tells me you're seeing both. Yeah. You're seeing curated artifacts being brought into the province, and you're also seeing essentially blanks, some type of um, raw material in a form that maybe you're going to use it as a knife um, or some other tool. And eventually it'll find its way into its final form, a uh, projectile point or, or something like that. After the projectile point is broken, maybe it's being worked into a scraper or something like that. So there is a long use life that becomes challenging for archaeologists to tease apart. But I suspect in Alberta, it's more the latter. Um, obsidian, because it is so amenable to flint napping, is being reduced to a more or less complete form closer to the source. By the time it shows up in Alberta, it's a finished artifact. 
Well, yeah, thinking of repurposed artifacts, so Margarita's also asking, she she mentions that the Batatana point in one of your slides kind of looks like it might have a drill tip, which is quite interesting. Yeah, we looked at that on a few of the artifacts. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head um, what we ended up concluding for that one. Um, but yeah, it does look like there's a bit of notching at the tip. So I suspect people are doing that. On a practical level, I don't know if obsidian makes a great drill. Um, a little too brittle, because, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's fairly brittle. Um, but you never know. Maybe it was just being used more as a, an all type of thing to puncture, puncture material as opposed to a drill. And, uh, next door to Alberta, of course, is Saskatchewan. And um, D Bird on Zoom is asking about um, whether you're familiar with some of the work that Gary Wolchuk is doing on obsidian from Saskatchewan and how this may fit in with your work. Yeah. Yeah, I think Gary is working with Timothy Allen, who is a co-author of this um, Alberta Obsidian paper. So they're kind of taking the lead on doing similar work in Saskatchewan and into Manitoba to understand not just the signal of how people are first colonizing those places, but trying to figure out where those obsidians are coming from to indicate the relationships that people in Saskatchewan and Manitoba had to other groups uh, on the Northern Plains. So uh, I know Timothy has already gathered a bunch of results. I won't share any of those because that's up to Tim and Gary to share um, in due time, but I am familiar with the work and it's exciting to expand that database of sourced obsidian in Western Canada. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, Angela, just uh, on Zoom, do you know if any obsidian has been found at Bluefish Caves? Oh, I don't, I don't believe so. I don't believe, there's so few artifacts from Bluefish Caves anyways, um, and I think they're all uh, chirts. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any obsidian. Yeah, I don't think so. A little uh, more of a personal question here for you, Todd. Uh, Donna is asking, what got you uh, interested in archaeology and lithics? And uh, do you have a favorite projectile point uh, <laughs> style? Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I got into archaeology kind of in a roundabout, ray, a roundabout way. When I was a little kid, I loved the outdoors. Um, so I always thought I was going to be a biologist or something like that. And then when I learned about archaeology, I realized it was this perfect blend of uh, being in the outdoors, but kind of using your noodle to understand how people adapted to ecosystems and environments. And I just found that so stimulating. There was the adventure of it all going on these digs to really interesting areas, including up in the Yukon. Um, uh, and I just got hooked on the idea of being in, being in interesting places and studying the way that people adapted to those uh, same outdoor places that I, I fell in love with as a kid. That's great. Uh, in terms of um, some of the favorite projectile points, I don't, I'm not a big typology guy and I'm, I'm not actually a huge lithic guy. I didn't, I didn't start off with a fascination with lithics, but it was more born out of practicality. I realized that, okay, 95% of our archeological record in the province is lithics. How do we, how do we give it value? And that's what got me really interested. I'm more interested in environmental relationships um, how do people adapt to places and, and lithics helps us understand some of those things. That's great. Excellent. Well, um, that was our last, oh, we got one more question that came in right as I was about to wrap things up. So I might as well ask that. Um, it was just on Facebook. Mike was wondering, as for blood residue analysis, is obsidian more or less absorbent than let's say quartzite? I don't really know. Um, on a practical level, I would say no, because it's such a uniform, clean surface, you're not going to get the same type of residues preserved in the tiny fissures and cracks. Yeah, and it's not my texture, the, yeah. Yeah, irregular surfaces of quartzites. I think a blood residue has been done on obsidians uh, in the United States, um, but I, I don't think it would be a very amenable material, especially for this old stuff, where you're just not as likely to get blood retained on those smooth surfaces over 10,000 years. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was thinking a lot about about that during your talk as well, you know, just the opportunity potentially to to relate uh, projectile points with with particular fauna would be really cool. Uh, you know, I think to me, the the evidence uh, from places like Wally's Beach of having camels, which are certainly a camelops is certainly a southern species. 
that's uh, that's dispersing northward uh, during the the late glacial during the deglacial is a really powerful piece of evidence. You know, if if animals are starting to move northward up into this region, you know, of course people are going to follow them, right? That's that's the, they're following. They're look, they're looking for food sources and and the opportunity to uh, gather raw materials on the way. You know, it all it all kind of fits together with uh, with that. Yeah, and we've thought about that in particular for the macro blades because they're kind of irregular artifacts. They might have those little kind of topographic, micro topographic places where you could detect protein residues to see if people were uh, processing some of these ice age species. All right. So I did get one more question that I think is pretty interesting. So even though I was about to wrap things up again, I'm going to ask. <laughs> hey, we could talk for we could just can, we can do this for hours, you know. <laughs> yeah. You can do some regulatory work, so this is great. Yeah, Todd doesn't want to have to go back to looking at permit reports. Come on, <laughs> let's, let's yeah. save the guy. We'll uh, give you one more question, then we'll wrap stuff up. So this one's from uh, Margarita again on Zoom. And she said, follow up to the research, can we look at other tool stones from the same site locations and see if similar sourcing slash transportation patterning exists? Yeah, and that's kind of what I was alluding to at the end there when I brought in the discussion of Tertiary Hills Clinker and Knife River Flint. Um, we can start to look at those diverse assemblages that are represented at the early sites to see how the North was connected to the South. And that's when you do reveal those incredibly large networks. So the next trick for us in Alberta is to get some in situ fluted material that you can connect to a, a diverse lithic assemblage. Right now we've got so few of those bona fide um, early kind of late Pleistocene and very early Holocene sites um, that we're kind of scrambling. We don't we don't have a, a ton of options, but but in the future if we can look at uh, all those other tool stones from those fluted point sites and, and older sites be a great opportunity to see how North America was connected. Well, and just because we're on this topic, you know, so you think people from White Sands, New Mexico, were seeing the weather change and let's, uh, you know, it's getting warmer up north. Let's let's start migrating and dispersing northward. It, it seems like, you know, this general pattern that uh, people in Beringia would have come down the coast or from Northeast Asia coming down the coast, arriving the Pacific Northwest, dispersing across the U.S. and then making their way to Alberta. It's it's, it's all solved now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see if this pattern is detectable in other raw materials or detectable in radiocarbon dates as more and more gets discovered out there. Um, I love the scientific process. If other work proves this wrong, then that's just great. We can all... Um, like I said, the Ice Free Corridor is, it involves so many different types of research. Um, we can look at ancient DNA studies and um, technologies, radiocarbon dates and quaternary fossils. And sometimes they tell, they come together to tell the same story and sometimes they don't. And that's uh, still interesting stuff. And Alberta is the place where it's all happening. So you're, you know, well situated in a, in a, in a region where you can ask these questions and sort of bring in uh, lots of different people to sort of, uh, you know, look at it from an interdisciplinary sort of perspective. And that's, you know, that's the University of Alberta has always been that place. It was, you know, sort of this interdisciplinary kind of archy, paleo, geo type things. And uh, yeah, I'm really, it's really exciting to see how far this discussion on the deglacial corridor has come, especially with the the human stuff, because there was the human stuff, the archaeological piece to it was always very speculative. There was lots of arm waving that went on in the past about, how people may have used this region, but I think this this work that you've done, Todd, is really starting to really put some real data and real information down that we can hang our hat on. So thank you. I really uh, really appreciate your work, and I'm uh, I really appreciate you uh, getting the chance to uh, present it to uh, our audience and and to folks out here. So thank you very much, Todd. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Todd, and. Um... Just one other shout out to a BCST we actually did last year with Robin Wojtka. Um, He did a science talk titled Smarter, Not Harder, uh, New Archaeological Survey Methods in the Ice Free Corridor. So if this talk sounds like something that interests everyone, I've just gone ahead and added the link to that to the chat here. Um, 
and I'm going to officially wrap stuff up now. No more questions, but are you it, kicking us out now, Claire? I Come am. On. I actually have something to get to at 1230. <laughs> so I'm down to the wire here, but um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule, Todd, and you Grant as well to help co-host. We're hoping to do more Beringia Center Science Talks this year, but we're still just finalizing um, the last speakers and we're hoping to continue the talks throughout the winter. So for those of you who are interested in watching again, please keep an eye on our Facebook or our website or just any of our social media channels and we'll be sharing them um, in roughly um, about a week out from the talk, we try to share them. But anyways, um, right thank you to the audience as well for joining us. And um, I hope everybody has a lovely Thursday. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care out there. Bye-bye. <laughs>